Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello, creatives. I'm Joanna Penn, and this is episode number 736 of the podcast, and it is Saturday the 3rd of February 2024 as this goes out. In today's show, I have an interview on your author brand with Isabel Knight, who is a publicist, and we talk about how to get to the deeper levels beneath your writing, the story beneath the story, as well as why your author brand is even more important in an age of AI, and much more. So that's coming up in the interview section. So in publishing, book marketing and AI things, since I'm now putting all of that together, this is a story of bookish positivity and I thought you would like it. So the BBC reports on 20 new miniature books that have been written to add to Queen Mary's Dollhouse, which has an extensive library. Originally designed to encapsulate the literary culture from when it was built in the 1920s, features handwritten works by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Vita Sackville West, A.A. Milne and Thomas Hardy. The books measure just 1.8 inches, 4.5 centimetres, and have been handcrafted by famous authors to mark the centenary of the house's completion. The new editions have been curated to reflect modern literature, with the books penned and decorated by well-known writers and illustrators, including Sir Tom Stoppard, Dame Jacqueline Wilson, Sir Ben Ockrey and Julia Donaldson, just a few of the famous faces. The stories or the little books range from short stories, plays and poetry collections to articles and recipes. The Queen, Camilla, championed the anniversary project to modernise the library and hand wrote an introduction. The doll's house was made for King George V's consort, Queen Mary, took three years to build, designed and built by British architect Sir Edwin Lutyens between 1921 and 24. It has electricity and running water. It is awesome. <laughs> uh, if you haven't seen it, if you haven't seen it in the UK, it's at Windsor Castle. You can go visit it. It is the largest and most famous doll's house in the world. It's a one to 12 scale miniature Edwardian royal residence. It has a grand piano, working lifts and a wine cellar with tiny bottles of real champagne. (laughs) It's just one of these little stories. I was like, do you know what? That is really cool. In this age of lots of things happening uh, that we can still make. Tiny, tiny books for a doll's house is just lovely. There's also a scaled down replica of the crown jewels in set with real stuff, (laughs) diamonds and rubies and things. So yes, uh, Queen Camilla is a real bookworm and does champion a lot of reading charities here in the UK. I love that story because I do really like that doll's house and certainly I had a doll's house that my granddad made for me. That was nothing like this one. (laughs) But yeah, I really, yeah, I love that story. I thought you'd like it. That's reported on the BBC. Links in the show notes so you can see the pictures of the tiny, tiny books. So in completely the opposite stuff, AI and publishing. So from tiny physical books hand bound by the royal bindery... (laughs) Two AI stuff. So Amazon announced Rufus, a new generative AI powered conversational shopping experience. So I mentioned this was coming in my December show on how generative AI would impact book sales and uh, book sales discovery and search. Uh, That episode is perhaps one of my most important future facing things and it is already starting to happen. So go back and listen to that uh, episode. It was just before Christmas. But yes, Rufus is an expert shopping assistant trained on Amazon's product catalogue and information from across the web answering customer questions on various shopping needs, products, comparisons, recommendations and to facilitate product discovery. Launching in beta to a small subset of customers in Amazon's mobile app, Rufus will progressively roll out to additional US customers in the coming weeks. So yeah, I don't have access, which is really annoying. The press release also says this, Amazon has been using AI 
expansively, sorry, very expansively for 25 plus years to improve customer experiences. The personalized recommendations customers get when they shop, the pick paths in our fulfillment centers, our drone deliveries, the conversational capabilities of Alexa and our checkout free Amazon Go stores are just a few examples of experiences fueled by AI. We believe generative AI is going to change virtually all customer experiences that we know. That line there, I mean, any authors left <laughs> or any people left who are, who shop online, <laughs> uh, I mean, this is going to change things. So we believe generative AI is going to change virtually all customer experiences that we know. Very interesting. This is just the beginning, remember? Um, this is the worst it's ever going to be. <laughs> So this past year, this is from the Amazon press release, this past year we've introduced a number of new generative AI powered capabilities in the Amazon store, AI generated review highlights, fit review highlights for personalized style guidance, uh, sorry, size guidance, also using generative AI to make product listings even more informative. This is only limited to the US and a limited number of people. So if you try out Rufus, if you get access and you try it out for book discovery, let me know how it goes. Email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com. I am very interested. Now, I hope it works in the same way that I use ChatGPT for book discovery. And I've already moved pretty much all my book discovery to ChatGPT. So I'll say something like, and this is a, a real search, I'm researching transcendence and the feeling of awe in Gothic cathedrals. Can you give me 10 books to read on this topic? So then it will give me a list of 10 books and then I might pick one of them uh, and say, so that will give me ideas for other things. So I might say, okay, I like the idea of how sacred music helps this feeling. Give me 10 more books that relate to architecture and sound. And then it will give me 10 more books. And this is essentially why I now have boxes of physical books. (laughs) around my house waiting for the Gothic Cathedral project. I have so much research to do. I'm very excited. So it is very nuanced search. I also use it for fiction. Uh, I'm, I sometimes say, okay, I really like this book by this author. Give me 10 books that might be similar to this. And I, I often, I already find it a lot better than Amazon's own recommendation engine, which of course is full of ads. The ChatGPT one is not full of ads. There's no ads. So yeah. There you go. So I use ChatGPT for most of my book discovery these days, as well as podcast episodes with authors and recommendations on X, which I still can't quite tear myself away from. <laughs> In fact, I got a recommendation on X yesterday, a book uh, called Forever Forever Strong um, by Dr. Gabrielle Lyons. Um, and listening to that, really good. Uh, again, it's about why we need to lift weights. So yeah, that's very good for our health, for lots of different kinds of health. Really interesting. Also, I wanted to mention that Amazon has launched an AI ready initiative. Um, They did a study and found that highly skilled AI talent is a priority for 73% of employers. This was in the US, but three out of four say they are unable to meet their AI talent needs. Employers expect their workers to earn up to 47% more in salaries if they upskill in AI, and AI will become integral to the way business is done, with 93% of businesses expecting they will use AI solutions across their organisations in the next five years. So Amazon has released a load of free courses that will help you upskill in AI. Microsoft are also offering lots of them. So if you want to start retraining and upskilling for the way things will be changing in the next five years, then uh, check that out. Again, I'll link in the show notes, but it's AWS free AI skills training. So in other things, while the New York Times is still suing OpenAI, they are also hiring for their own AI initiatives, focused on prototyping uses of generative AI and other machine learning techniques to help with reporting and how the Times is presented to readers, although they say human journalists will still write the news, as reported by The Verge. 
Now, this echoes the Hollywood Reporter article I mentioned last week on reports on a potential licensing deal with the Authors Guild, exploring a blanket license to artificial intelligence companies for use of content. We have to be proactive because generative AI is here to stay, says Mary Raisenberger, chief executive of the organisation. They need high quality books. Our position is that there's nothing wrong with the tech, but it has to be legal and licensed. So once again, you can be conflicted about generative AI, but it is not going away. And it would be better for us to license our content rather than try to fight the technological changes that are coming ever faster. And as ever, yes, I do want to license my content. I really hope that we can get some collective agreements for authors that way. Also, uh, marketing is one of the things that authors are more keen on using AI for. And the Marketing Against the Grain podcast had a good show on this. So that's Marketing Against the Grain, which uh, it's one of those podcasts I actually subscribe to. I don't subscribe to many shows and listen regularly, but they do enough that I find it useful. They're often ahead on using AI tech for marketing purposes. And they did a good show tools and strategies you must use to survive the 2024 revolution. Yes, it is a clickbait title, but they are marketers, so why not? (laughs) Definitely worth a listen. One of the hosts is Irish and uh, they're both very enthusiastic tech chaps. I guess tech bros would be the word, but I I find their enthusiasm kind of infectious. Uh, So yeah, that is Marketing Against the Grain podcast. Links in the show notes. So in personal news, I am back from my whistle stop book research trip to Vienna, Nuremberg and Cologne. Uh, And that's Vienna in Austria, Nuremberg and Cologne in Germany. And you can see pictures on my books and travel blog at booksandtravel.page. Again, links in the show notes. I've posted an article with step by step aspects of the trip and the interesting bits, as well as photos and uh, practical stuff. Uh, I flew into Vienna, took the train to Nuremberg and then on another train onto Cologne. And it really reminded me that everything in Europe is so close and so easily accessible by train. And I know Americans not really used to this because your train infrastructure between cities is just not so great. And I know because I have tried it. I have tried your American train system and uh, it is not as good as Europe, that's for sure. Uh, Europeans really travel a lot by train and, and everything's super close. So you can get the trains very easily across Europe. Um, so yeah, this trip was mostly for Spear of Destiny, which is my next arcane thriller, but also the Gothic Cathedral book. One of the highlights was seeing the Spear of Destiny, yes itself, in the Hofburg in Vienna. And if you don't know the story, it is allegedly the Spear of Longinus, which pierced the side of Christ on the cross. And it is a, a holy relic as such of the Catholic Church and the bearer can again, allegedly, access great power and has to make a choice between good and evil. Now, Hitler took possession of it in uh, the mid-1930s, which, of course, is the background to my plot. I also enjoyed the Capuchin Crypt of the Habsburgs and the Crypt of St Stephen's Cathedral as well. And that has a beautiful tiled roof. Lots of lovely pictures from there. And I also went to the Art Bunker, below the castle in Nuremberg where the Nazis kept looted art and treasure and that was also where they kept the Spear of Destiny during the war and if you've seen the film The Monuments Men with George Clooney and Matt Damon uh, then and I also I watched that while I was away to make it more atmospheric uh, but yes that that's not necessarily about that particular bunker but it is about the um, allied uh, chase to find all the art basically. And probably the highlight of the trip, no, definitely the highlight of the trip was Cologne Cathedral, which is magnificent, possibly one of the most beautiful cathedrals in the world and certainly one of the biggest. It is enormous. (laughs) And I was quite emotional when I stood in front of it and I, because I set a scene there in Tomb of Relics when uh, terrorists come for the relics of the Magi, which are in the cathedral, and the cathedral is actually built to to house the relics of the Magi, uh, the three kings. And I spent hours taking virtual tours of the cathedral while I sat at home during the pandemic, wishing I could be there in person because, you know, I love to research my books in person. 
So yeah, when I stood in front of it, I, I felt a bit teary, to be honest. And I really enjoyed being there. I, I was only in Cologne sort of 48 hours and I, I went back to the cathedral several times. And it's very memento mori to see beauty at such a scale. And uh, this particular place took 600 years to finish, which is really cathedral thinking indeed, that sort of building for the long term, something much bigger than our tiny, tiny lives. And I will reflect more on that in the Gothic Cathedral book for sure. Uh, Yes, so you can see the pictures in my blog post at booksandtravel.page. I'll put a link in the show notes. I have also started writing the first few chapters of Spear of Destiny and I know that I know the direction it's going in. I know the kind of approximate story, uh, but I am a discovery writer, so I don't know that much. I do know that it's going to also be set in Washington, D.C., based on the trip I took last year. I am still trying to figure out where the real Spear of Destiny might be. And as with all my arcane thrillers, my stories have to be based on as much truth as possible. I have these, um, I guess, constraints. It's very important to put constraints on the creativity. You know, you have to have your your rules. And so I have to do research until I find the real story. And then I can kind of twist that into fiction. That's how my arcane thrillers work. So yeah, I have some threads I need to bind them all together, much more to come. So I've set aside February and March for the draft and I've moved my Kickstarter out to June so I have more time to edit and more time to put effort into the launch. There's lots I want to do um, and Kickstarters do take effort to do a spike launch. Now I mentioned in my interview with Paddy last week that I couldn't get my Kickstarter pre-launch page up. Well, Good news, it is now up for Spear of Destiny. So if you're interested and you do want to see the cover, because it's awesome, (laughs) go along to jfpen.com forward slash destiny. That's jfpen.com forward slash destiny. Links in the show notes. As we discussed last week with Paddy, it really helps if you sign up for the pre-launch page and there will be a Kickstarter only special edition, which uh, the cover is... Basically, it's the spear in front of the Capitol in Washington, D.C., which gives you a hint of the story. I love it. It's awesome. So go check it out at jfpen.com forward slash destiny. And yes, you're going to get to know that URL quite well. (laughs) So thanks for all your emails and comments and photos. I got loads of photos over the last couple of weeks, which is awesome. I love how international the podcast is. Uh, So Natasha sent a picture from her walk along the coast in Mallorca, uh, which is an island off the the coast of Spain, which is lovely. Julia sent a picture of the view of the New Zealand countryside. Uh, Thorne said she's listening on the daily walk through Portland in Oregon. Ted says, I listen to the show on my commute to the day job. One picture is the train I ride and the other is the second floor of Houston's convention centre. So Houston in Texas in the USA. Guillermo sent a picture from a cemetery in a tiny place close to the Alps, which is wonderful. And uh, finally, Victoria sent a picture from Lake Henry in central Florida at the docks. That was a lovely bunch of pictures. Oh, yes. And Jan sent a picture of Mr. Darcy, her five month old ragdoll cat. (laughs) I love the cat pictures. Uh, Coming home to my cats was wonderful. I really missed them, actually, while I was away. So yes, thank you for all the pictures. I really love that. And uh, then in terms of comments, I'll just pick one. Bonnie says, I just finished the podcast with Paddy. So good. I learned so much. I was going to do too big of a first Kickstarter and I'm now breathing a sigh of relief. I'm going to do the first three books in my series already written instead of all six. So many ideas. Thanks for the podcast. Super helpful. So you can leave a comment on the podcast show notes at thecreativepen.com or on the YouTube channel or email me. Send me pictures of where you're listening, joanna at thecreativepen.com. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. So today's show is sponsored by Pro Writing Aid, because however you choose to publish, whether you go direct to readers or you go indie or you want a traditional deal, you need to make your book the best it can be. It is one of my absolute must-use tools in my writing process. 
I use ProWritingAid for every book and short story, both fiction and non-fiction. I open ProWritingAid on my computer, then I open my Scrivener project within it and I work through each chapter, which is more manageable than doing a whole document, a whole book. And it suggests improvements and I accept some of them, but I don't accept all the changes, but it always helps me find lots of problems and it integrates with Word and other writing software as well. ProWritingAid knows all the rules of editing and helps you apply them. For example, making your writing more active, finding repeated words, finding words you could improve, sentence structure, grammar, punctuation issues, as well as typos, spacing problems and more. So why use software to help? Why don't you just learn all the grammar and writing rules and apply them yourself? Well, we all use tools to improve our process, and we are also often blind to our writing issues. It helps to have another pair of eyes, even if the eyes are software. So won't an editor do all this? Well, yes, they can, but I'd rather pay my editor, my human editor, to fix the things that the software can't. As brilliant as ProWritingAid is, it cannot read your manuscript as a whole and comment on bigger issues like character development, inconsistencies, plot holes or flow in a non-fiction book. So I use ProWritingAid as my essential editing tool before sending to my human editor. You can check out the free edition or get 25% off the premium edition by using my link prowritingaid.com forward slash Joanna. That's prowritingaid.com forward slash Joanna, J-O-A-N-N-A. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing, but my time in creating the show is sponsored by my community at patreon.com forward slash the creative pen. So thanks to the 29 new patrons who've joined since I recorded the last show before my trip, and thanks to everyone who's been supporting for months and years. Last week, I put out a video on my bank account setup. (laughs) which is a behind-the-scenes business video. Now you might think, oh, that's a bit dry, but no, it is intended to help you save on exchange rate differences and bank fees with multi-currency payments. And if you're using Amazon and you don't use multi-currency bank accounts, you're missing out. So that was my useful video for my patrons. If you join the community, you get that video and all the backlist videos and audio, as well as access to the monthly Q&A where you can ask your questions. It's an extra a solo show a month and you get the backlist too. The Patreon is now a monthly subscription, the equivalent of a black coffee a month or a couple of coffees if you're feeling generous. So if you get value from the show and you want more, come on over and join more than a thousand authors. Yes, we've cracked a thousand. I'm really thrilled about that. So thanks to all patrons and thanks to new patrons. You're amazing. I'm so glad you find the show useful after all this time. Join the community at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen and there is a patreon app so if you're worried about access you can access everything through there uh, and also on your computer or whatever device you prefer right let's get into the interview Isabel Knight is a professional publicist speaker and PR and brand mentor to authors and business founders She is also adjunct professor in MA, PR and advertising at the American International University of London. So welcome to the show, Isabel. Thank you very much, Jo. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, no, I'm excited to talk about this topic. But before we get into it, tell us a bit more about you and your background in the publishing industry. So my background is as a publicist. The bulk of my career was in film. So I was a film publicist for a long time. Then I moved into TV. So, and this was film production and TV production as well. So a publicist who goes on set and works with the actors and the directors and the writers and that kind of thing, as well as publicizing releases of films and TV shows. And through that time, I worked with also on some book releases with authors, but particularly towards at the end of of my kind of traditional publicist career, I worked with J.K. Rowling and the production team that produced the Strike series of books Ooh, I love um, it. for TV. So it wasn't J.K. Rowling, it was J.K. Rowling writing as Robert Galbraith. So I was on that for a few years, which was all very exciting. But then the pandemic hit and everything kind of changed in terms of obviously the way that publicists were able to work and that productions were able to work. So I took my business online and 
So now that's, I do everything online. And I started working with, because I'd come from the creative industries, and I was working with people who were writing books. So this was kind of business owners, but then also fiction writers. And I discovered that lots of people were writing books, but didn't have any idea of how to essentially bring those books to an to a readership or to find an audience and grow an audience and perhaps actually become known as authors and sell books. So because I'd spent a long time, kind of 20 years or so, working with people to essentially make them famous and make their creative output famous. And I thought, well, loads of these people just don't have any of the kind of resources and tools and knowledge that as a publicist working in those big industries, you kind of start to take it for granted that people know what to do when it comes to promoting themselves. And of course, I quickly realised that many people don't know what to do. So now, rather than doing people's PR or publicity for them, which, you know, it for most indie and self-published authors is a very expensive thing to do. But what I do now is I mentor and essentially teach authors how to go about building their brand and promoting themselves, creating a name for themselves and creating a readership, a fan base, growing that readership and selling some books. So that's what I now concentrate on doing. And I absolutely love working with, it's mostly indie and self-published authors, but also small press authors, basically any author that finds themselves having to essentially do most of their own marketing and promotion. Well, that's definitely most of the listeners. <laughs> so that's great. So you mentioned the word brand there, and I feel like it's so difficult to know what is an author brand anyway. So maybe you could get a bit into that. Tell us what is a brand and why is it so important, perhaps even more in this age of AI? Yes, absolutely. So the brand, so because I'm a publicist, I, I come from this, come at this from the angle of if I was going to, so just imagine the scenario, if I was going to put you in front of, say, a journalist tomorrow, and they were going to ask you about being an author, and they were going to ask you about your books, what they really want to know is, and this kind of extends to what your reader wants to know, is why should they be interested in the books that you have written? So this, so your brand goes much deeper than what is the book or what are the books, what are they about, what's the genre, what are the tropes that you're using? And it goes much further than that into who, who are you as an author and what is it that you have to say as an author that is going to give us, the readers, something to, to care about? Because we've got to care about this enough that we're going to give your book a shot now now that we're all surrounded by content so much all of the time in our age of social media and increasingly in our age of AI, we're bombarded constantly with kind of messages and in the book world as it gets busier and busier and self-publishing and indie publishing gets busier, which is very exciting, but also makes it, I think, even harder now for authors to stand out in that kind of busyness and noise. So we have to pit, find the thing that makes the author unique and the way we do that is by looking at what I so I call it the author brand story which I know sounds quite terrifying to to authors when they're first coming into this but if we kind of set aside the the word brand for the moment and we just look at well what is it about the author that make that makes them unique why are they writing what are they writing so, for example, if you're a fiction author and writing romance, or you might be writing fantasy or science fiction, why are you writing in that genre? What is it that's important to you about it? And what messages do you want the reader to take away? What do you want them to remember about the book? So with a journalist, they're going to be asking, why do you write? That would probably be the first question, or what made you become an author? So it's thinking about that, and it's thinking through what can you say about yourself as an author. So I go into, most people become authors because they're emotionally led to do it. The motivation tends to be emotional when we're writing and the themes that we're writing about. So what are the things that drew you to those themes? What are the things that led you to write what you're writing? Oh, there's so many things there. I've been writing notes <laughs> to oh, come back on. Good. Okay. So you talked there about 
we have so much content all the mm. time and mm. that the person on the other end, whether they're a journalist or a reader, needs to know, I guess, who you are as an author and what the emotional connection is between yeah. you in some way. And so I feel like for the last like decade, we have focused much more on content. So you said content, books being content, even though it's not a very romantic word. But mm. are we now at a point where connection human connection is more important than content or has it actually always been that way I think human connection has always been important but I think we're in a place now with obviously with AI making it so much easier to produce content and content that looks like so many other kinds of content and I think this is the point when you have lo lots and lots of content that essentially is is all it's the same so if we've got 10 romance novels all lined up together and they're all dealing with similar kinds of tropes and they've all got the the hero and the heroine or whatever's going on in those in in the novels so to tell if you if you sit and tell a reader right which of these 10 books should you read well this one's about this this one's about this that reader will probably get quite bored quite quickly listening to what are all these books about. But if we can tell them something about what the book means emotionally to the author. So if they say, well, I was actually led to write this book because I've been through something similar myself, or I'm really interested in exploring how women are treated by um, by their lovers. Or if we make it a more compelling story on that human emotional level then that suddenly becomes more interesting to the reader and they can start to engage with it on their own personal human level and this is the, this is really the thing that AI you know I, I think I've said on social media recently it can't do this perhaps yet <clears throat> and maybe that's another conversation about whether AI will ever be able to do this but to replicate that that unique human emotion and because it's slightly different for everyone. Everyone has their own unique story. We've all arrived at what we're doing from different places. We all have different experiences. But the human emotions that we feel are, you know, of, are often quite universal. You know, lots of other people will have also felt those emotions. So it's how do we draw that, that emotional connection by telling our unique story? Mm. And that's the thing that I think AI, you know, this is where humans have the edge over computers. Yeah, I totally agree. And or you can certainly generate books to market or generate art or whatever you want to do, if not exactly, then very soon. But as you say, what you can't do is put that emotional reason behind it. And this is where I'd like to get into something a bit more practical, because I've been thinking about this. So with nonfiction, I feel it's much easier. So I wrote a book, Pilgrimage, which is a kind of midlife travel memoir. It mm. is about pilgrimage. I mean, it's got religious elements and menopause elements. And th these are things that humans go through. <laughs> so with yeah. nonfiction, it seems easier. But with fiction... I do an author's note at the end of all my books. Every single book I have, sometimes a long, sometimes short reasons why I wrote the book and personal side of writing, my research process, all of that. I was wondering about trying to turn those author's notes into something, I don't know, me talking about them on a video, doing a, another podcast on it. I don't know. I'm starting to feel like for my fiction it's hard to do this. So what do you think? What are some of your practical ideas for bringing that emotion and that personality behind fiction in particular? Yeah. And fiction is is harder, you're right, because non-fiction, non we can quite often construct the story behind it very well. Fiction is harder and therefore it's also can be a lot, can be juicier as well. It can be more interesting for someone like me working with authors to do this. So the the first thing to say is it's it is difficult to do this for yourself to see your emotional brand emotionally led brand story author story objectively is hard to do because we're so close to it but to start thinking through this is is looking through what other what are the themes so often the themes that mean a lot to you personally tend to come out in our writing in our fiction as the themes that we're keen to explore in the fiction. So when I do this work with authors, what I'm doing is looking for the threads that kind of tie 
the author's passions, motivations, and we'll see that reflected in the writing. So it's kind of trying to tie all of that together. So if we can identify that, how can we communicate that to readers in a more scalable manner? Because, I mean, obviously, like we're doing a podcast. This is a one to one. We can get into the backstory and I, as I do on this show. But for many authors who are trying to scale their marketing, what are some of the ways they can portray this more personal, emotional side in a scalable manner? So when we've kind of cracked what are the kind of big themes that you're exploring on a personal level and also in your writing, then you can start to use those themes to attract your readers when you're and, and use that in your marketing. So you can use it in your social media. Most of the time when authors do this work with me, that they'll put their story on their website. So when we see the about the author, we're seeing something that is much less generic than the author enjoys yachting in their spare time and has three kids that you know the kind of bios that you see a lot of but they're telling us something about them and why they write so they'll start that on their website and then often they'll start to weave that into their social media and what happens is it gives the author so much more confidence first of all to market themselves because they feel like they know what they want to say because they feel like they've they found the thing that is going to tie them to their potential readers. And what that also does is it it then shows you, kind of pinpoints who your potential reader is really going to be. Because when I say to authors, right, step one is figure out what are we going to say about you as the author. Step two is who are we going to say it to, i.e. who do we want to attract? Who is our reader? And people say to me, oh, but my reader is just everyone that enjoys fantasy or everyone that enjoys YA. But to encourage authors to get more specific about who their reader actually is, you know, the reader who is going to resonate with the big themes that they've pinpointed in their brand story. So once we've got that, we, and we're much more confident in who do we want to, to attract, which readers do we want to speak to, then we w- The author can start to weave that into their social media whenever they're talking on a podcast or if they're doing an interview, if they're writing an article. It will all of the all of these things can kind of form the foundation of what they want to say. That's really interesting. Can we explore the word theme a little more? Um, Because, of course, as fiction writers, the word theme can mean different things. Um, So I guess just to be specific to me, (laughs) because we're because you're on my show. So in my fiction as J.F. Penn. Mm. Pretty much every single one of my books has something that is religious. Uh, Although I'm not a Christian, everything resonates with religious history, religious places, religious myth, the supernatural in the way that it falls towards the religious side, as opposed to like witches and and ghosts and things. So that's something that is an underlying theme in all of my, my fiction writing. So is that what you mean by a theme or should it be a more emotional element like often my books are about sisters yes so so what I would say so so imagine we're doing an author brand story session then so as it's just (laughs) as it's just the two of us just the two of us no one listening (laughs) so I would say to you okay well that's really interesting about the religious myth and the supernatural so I would be trying to find out, so where does that come from? Where does the kind of fascination with those things come from? And so if we're looking, so you mentioned sisters. So that, again, is an intriguing theme. So what is it about sisters? Is it about the relationships between sisters? And is that somehow then tied into the themes of the supernatural, the religious myths? So what I'm always saying to authors, but, you know, why? So tell me why that's important and why is that important? So that we get right underneath the skin of it. Um, and often this brings stuff up for people that they hadn't ever kind of articulated ever, often, sometimes not even to themselves. But they'll say to me, oh, that's always been there. It's like a huge kind of thing that I'm re- that is so, so important to me. It's so integral to who I am and what I'm writing. Mm, that's interesting. My my last nonfiction book was called Writing the Shadow, Turn Your Inner Darkness into Words. And that's actually the process that one gets into in terms of writing the shadow is these deeper side, the things you might not have 
really known about consciously, but that affect everything you do. So it's very interesting that you're going down to such a deep level for people. (laughs) I feel like so much of book marketing is on the surface. What we've concentrated on a lot in the indie community has been keywords and categories and ad copy and cover design as well. Mm. And cover design is obviously really important, but what you're talking about there is super, super personal. But I guess I'm still interested in how we turn that into marketing yeah so let's say just briefly I write about sisters I'm the eldest of five kids but my dad had a second marriage and my two sisters were a lot younger than me so over a decade younger than me so I always felt very uh, scared for them and wanted to protect them and so in my books my characters often protect their sisters as I always wanted to do when I was really a teenager you know they were born when I was in puberty so it's like an emotional time but that story is not in any (laughs) it's not in any of my fiction even though there are so many sisters and that kind of of thing so how do I turn that example into practical marketing well that I mean first of all that's a great story and I can't believe it's not in any of your (laughs) (laughs) So to get it from this kind of very deeply personal place, and the way I do this with with authors is I say, right, the first kind of iteration is the version that you wouldn't even share, you know, you might share it with your cat, but that's about it. But we're, we're turning it from something that's deeply personal, that's filled with very personal details that you might not want your entire readership to know about. And we, we kind of, morph that into a version where we're really concentrating on as I, like I said earlier the emotional themes that other people are going to resonate with and they don't necessarily need to know all of your personal details in order to understand it so what I would focus on there is you know we're writing about protecting vulnerabilities from what from what you said mm. it's that feeling of perhaps feelings of responsibility for those who are vulnerable, but perhaps also remembering your own vulnerabilities and knowing what, and and in a way you're protecting yourself by protecting the others, you know, others who you love who are also vulnerable. So we could go there with it. So when we start talking about that, then other people say, oh yeah, I can resonate with that. I, I can connect with that. So if we start to to weave that into our marketing so we don't have to give the whole personal backstory every time you know these these books are exploring vulnerability and how do we protect ourselves and our loved ones from vulnerability Mm, it's interesting I mean I primarily write thrillers and most thrillers actually are about saving the world from some big threat So that's a sort of blown up version of of protecting. I say blown up. (laughs) I explode a lot of things in my books. But I mean, the sort of protecting the world, protecting the family, protecting my sisters, that kind of thing. It is interesting to think about on a bigger level. But I do want to come at you. I mean, you mentioned there the several layers of the process, the sort of very personal one that you might just share with your cat. But then you also used the word, I wrote it down, you used the word juicier earlier. Yes. Uh, like, oh, that's kind of juicy information that as a publicist, that you might go, oh, let's follow that story. What's really behind there? And I feel like that's a real journalism thing. I've got some friends who are journalists, so they do that too. And But the thing is, and I know I uh, at one point I did get on TV and I was in papers and magazines and things, and I, I was very uncomfortable with the whole thing. And I feel like, especially these days with a lot of outrage, a lot of hate online, this fear of being attacked by the press or on social media or getting some kind of public backlash over something, even if we didn't mean it, (laughs) um, Mm. we're afraid of that juiciness. We're afraid of putting that stuff into the world for fear of being hurt or our career being destroyed. So how do you address that? Mm. Yeah, and this is a really, really good point. It's an excellent question. Because, yes, that word juicy um, is, yeah, it's, it's misleading really because i agree i agree with you that what i'm not doing is i'm not trying to put people into situations where they are vulnerable where they feel exposed and they feel like you know they are opening themselves up in a way when they can't protect themselves from potential judgment or being attacked online or whatever it is so 
what I'm not doing is looking for what I call the kind of cheap headlines. Mm. You know, I'm not interested in, you know, I mean, a lot because uh, PR PR has, you know, sometimes deservedly has this reputation of being, you know, that we're just looking for the easy headline. We're looking for the salacious gossip. We're looking for the juicy story that we can exploit. And what I'm doing is is showing authors, in fact, how to do the opposite of that, which is by taking control of your own author story. So starting with the personal level and then building it up into something where you get to decide what you share and what you don't share. And that's really, really crucial. So you're not just creating your story, but you're curating it as well. So you decide that bit's going in, that bit's not going in. And I always say, you know, the story police are never going to come by and say, oh, but you didn't tell us about that. Because what you choose not to share, you you don't share it and people aren't going to know about that. Um, But if you get to control your story, and that's when I said it gives people the confidence to then go out and market themselves because they've got a handle on their story. They know what it is they that they want to say. So we know the compelling piece that we want to give to potential readers, but we also know we don't have to share personal details. We don't have to be vulnerable if we've decided that's not something we're going to share. So again, going back to that example, that if I put an author in front of a journalist and the journalist that will, you know, will start asking lots of questions. So why is that important to you? Where does that come from? So if you've already done that work yourself of deciding this is what I'm saying about myself as an author, then you have that story ready. Yeah, it's it's like thinking about it in advance. And I think for a lot of people, it's uh, things come back from the past and things taken out of context. So things you might not have thought about or even you shouldn't need to think about so I'll give a specific example which would be interesting but and we're not talking about politics here but I have a series where there is a character who is half Israeli and I've been getting emails from people making comments about my political affiliation because of fiction that I started writing like 15 years ago and so it's like even if we control the story then people take us out of context or they take things in our book. I've even had people email me lines from my novels that characters have said and say, you must think this, you are X about X, no need to go into details. But this and this, I've been doing this for many years now, so I'm kind of used to it. But there are times when it's like, seriously, this is not good. So even if I curate one part of my story, it doesn't stop people coming in other ways so I guess what how do we deal with that if I guess if we want to be seen if we want people to buy our books which we do (laughs) is this just part of the game that we have to deal with this is the whole idea of having a brand it's deciding how you're presenting yourself what is it that you're showing of yourself and it doesn't mean that you're showing the whole of yourself it it's deciding which which pieces of you what version of you is the public facing you and when you're de- and when you get like you just described when you you might get backlash and criticism from things that you know even that you've said or written years before if you're sure of your brand story you can always come back to that and use that to respond to any criticism that you get and again this is where working with a publicist at times like that can also be helpful as well is to figure out how to respond to to things like that but if you've decided in your brand story all of the work that you put out as an author and deciding how you talk about it and how it relates back to the author brand story that, that you've decided that you've written then it's much easier then to respond to to those kind of criticisms rather than it feeling like you're on the back foot or feeling like somebody's exposed it exposed something that you weren't prepared for you didn't know how to respond to but that is tricky if you if if that is happening and say it's something you wrote before you were very secure of, of how you're presenting yourself so that is difficult to come back to but we can absolutely do it it's deciding which pieces of you are the public facing and which pieces of you are private. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. So let's take someone who has an established brand. And it's very interesting that you worked with Robert Galbraith uh, as JK Rowling because Mm. this pivot. So sometimes people feel trapped in a brand and they want to pivot into 
another brand and that is a really good example yeah. now it's questionable whether robert galbraith would have been as successful without it being outed somehow mm, or yes. leaked potentially yeah. that yeah. who the real person was which is interesting question but in terms of less famous authors if you want to pivot out of one thing and be known for something else how do you bring existing fans along can you pivot that author story or are you best to just start another name so this, again, is a brilliant question because I get this a lot from authors. And I think for you as well, you mentioned you have kind of two different brands. So authors either have more than one existing brand, as it were, or they want to pivot. They're known for one thing and they want to pivot into the new thing. So we don't need to create lots of different brands. We don't need to become lots of different people, lots of different authors, we, can, we only need one author brand story. That story can evolve as you do as a writer, as an author. The story can grow with you, but the kind of fundamentals of that story will remain the same. Using the J.K. Rowling example, when she first wrote the Harry Potter series, the kind of the story behind that was that she was a single mother who was struggling, wasn't getting a break for it for ages, but it was that kind of that fan writing fantasy stories that kind of take you out of reality and then when she pivoted again it was the not being known for one story change pivoting and becoming known for something completely different and wondering whether she could get away with being anonymous and obviously she didn't get away with that for very long at all but it's always creating that kind of story behind the story which is what we want to do but we can use one brand story to wrap together all of your genres all of your books I work with authors sometimes who are you know they might be writing romance and children's books for example but we don't need to create several different brands we can do that under one brand but we're looking at what are the themes that tie together those different genres because I would say 100% of the time when it's the same person writing they're going to be that those motivations are going to be the same across their genres. Yeah, I I see. I disagree with that. I think that especially as one writes a lot more books, Mm. then it does almost become, well, the audiences are very different. So my audience is Joanna Penn is quite different to JF Penn. They're different aspects of my personality. They're different aspects. The readership are different. The email lists are different. The ads are different. Everything looks different. You know, it has a different voice even. Um, mm. Not because I'm mm. in somehow a split personality or anything like that. But uh, you mentioned children's and romance. Well, mm. that's fine. But I know a lot of children's authors who also write horror and they have to split their websites or erotica. Maybe it's not sweet romance. Maybe it's erotica. And so people, certainly in the indie community, I think we tend to write generally a lot of more books than in the traditional industry. Yes. Yes. And so often we are moving into these further parts of ourselves, I guess. So I I certainly agree with you on one level, but I also disagree because I feel like it's actually more sensible to manage the more, at least the more direct marketing around email and ads and all of that kind of stuff as two brands. Yeah. And I, I do agree with that. That is absolutely true that to do definitely in your direct marketing and the way you present yourself is going to change across your different brands. But you can still have your kind of 360 degree author brand story so that we we can still see that it's you, even if you might be writing in wildly different or, or opposing genres. But you can absolutely have, you know, you'll have your two brands visually, you'll have your two brands in the way you present yourself and maybe even and in your name. But your author brand story will still have, will still be able to trace it back to that story behind behind the story but you will absolutely need to adapt in your direct marketing and the way you talk about those different genres for sure yeah no I I find this so interesting and as we said at the beginning I think this is just more and more important over time but I also know that for my fiction I've hidden behind the books yes because it's much easier for me to write a book (laughs) than it is for example I've never done a live reading of my fiction never never done that never done a book launch never Mm. done any Mm. most of them never done most of the things that most traditionally published authors do as part of I guess what they call marketing it's very different to what 
we often call marketing in in the indie world, but I feel like that's actually becoming more important. So I did want to ask you because, again, one of the feelings in the indie community is hiring a publicist may well be too expensive. You actually, I think you said it yourself a bit earlier, it might not be worth it. But when might it be worth it as an indie author? What stage of an indie author career or what might they achieve if they do hire a publicist or work with someone on this? So this is another interesting question. So lots of the authors that I work with are getting off the starting blocks in terms of working out what their marketing strategy is going to be, working out who they are, how to present themselves as authors and to get going. And then they start to build the kind of results that if I was working, if I was providing what we call done for you publicity services that I would want to see, which is getting themselves interviewed on the radio, they get into magazines, they're interviewed on podcasts, they start giving talks and they do book launches at bookshops and that kind of thing. So the what the way I'm working with authors is they are they are able to get all of these results for themselves with me kind of guiding and supporting and showing them this is what you have to do next. And for example, learning how to pitch yourself as an author is such a huge skill that loads of authors struggle with, because if you don't have a background in marketing and PR, that kind of thing is going to be really difficult. So at the point where you might want to hire a publicist to do this for you is the point where as an author, you've grown your brand to a certain level, you've got a good readership, you know how to do your direct marketing, you're making sales you're engaging with your readers, you have more of a relationship with your readers, as in, but you know why they're reading your books, you know kind of who they are, what they're looking for in you as the author. And that you've got a fan base, you've got readers who are eagerly awaiting the next book in the series and so on. So when you get to the point where you're doing so much direct marketing, actually, some of it is about not having the time to do all of your publicity, PR, marketing, all by yourself. So if you're at that level, then hiring a publicist for your next big book launch, you know, that could be the right time to do it. But until you get to that point, learning how to do so much of this for yourself and how it works, so learning how to establish relationships with journalists, for example, how to pitch yourself. Because remember, how to pitch yourself applies to pitching to agents, publishers, journalists, book festival organisers, all of these people are people you need to pitch to. So once you've learned that skill, you can use it over and over again. So learning how to present yourself is something that once you've kind of cracked that, then that's a skill that you'll use over and over. Whereas if you're hiring a publicist to do it for you, they'll go off and they'll do the strategy and they'll bring back the results. But if you without you being so involved in understanding what that process is. So I think my philosophy is teaching people how they can do this for themselves. I'm not teaching you how to become a publicist, but I'm teaching you how to understand how to market yourself and what's going to work for you to reach your readership, because then you can repeat those actions over and over as you go through your author career. Yes. And again, I feel like as indies, we've spent a long time, like many of us are very, very good at direct sales. <laughs> but mm. in a changing world where the human connection is going to become more important, I, I do think this is important. So hence why mm. we're talking. And yeah. also you do have a course coming up. You have lots of things you you do available on your site. So just tell us about your services and where people can find you online. Brilliant. So my website is buildyourbrandwithpr.com. And I have a six week build your author brand course that I run. It's an online course, but you get access to me. We do live sessions. So it's not just kind of learning on your own. You're learning in a group with other authors and you have direct access to me. And we have lots of live Q&A sessions. And that We'll start again on the 24th of February. So that's a six week online course. 2024, um, we should say. 2024, yes. Yeah. 24th of February, 24. Um, and you can also work with me one to one as well. So I work with lots of clients online as well. So you can either do group programs or one to one programs. Mm. And do you repeat that over time? Like if, if people listen to this later and they want to do it, do you do them several times a year? Yes. Yeah, so I run the six week online course that runs three times a year right. at the moment. So yes, yeah, so if you miss the next one, then you can sign up for the, for the one after. Brilliant. And you have an email list and everything there as well. So people can find out more. 
Yes, yes. So you can sign up to the email list through the site. And if you feel like working one to one with me on your author brand story, you can also book a quick call with me to talk about that too. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Isabel. That was great. Thank you. Thanks, Jo. It's a pleasure. So I hope you found this interview interesting and that it made you think about what might lie beneath your books. What is the story behind your story and how could you incorporate aspects of your deeper self into how you connect with readers and how can you dig deeper into your author brand in this age of AI? So let me know what you think. You can leave a message on the show notes at thecreativepen.com or on the YouTube channel or email me joanna at thecreativepen.com. So next week, I have an interview on writing and producing a micro-budget film with Jeffrey Crane Graham. And that kind of independent filmmaking has a lot in common with being an indie author. So we have a really good chat. In the meantime, happy writing, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.